We are continuing to look at this great multitude drawn from every tribe, tongue, language, nation, gathered before the throne, that number, that countless number that is represented by the 144,000. Now one of the elders answered me or asked me this following question, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? Now, just a word of caution, if the Lord ever asks you any question about any matter, don't pretend you know anything. Humble yourself before the Lord and He'll give you revelation. John is fully apprised of this principle, so he doesn't offer an answer. He knew, he knew that he was about to be shown something. So he said, Sir, you know. And certainly the answer came. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now, the word there, to come out of, is the Greek term ekomai or ekomi, E-R-C-H-O-M-A-I, ekomi, and it literally means to appear, to emerge, to enter, to fall out, to grow out of, to pass. It's a derivative of uh, two Greek words and it may be applied either literally or figuratively, such as either observing some people who have actually progressed from one state to another or figuratively, as in the case that is being used here, to have emerged out of, to have endured, to have um, ascended, uh, to have survived in the way that the Great Tribulation was designed to weed out and cause a certain group to remain. Now, anyone who thinks that you're simply going to give God your hand or give man your hand, give God your heart, as one famous preacher used to say, and join the church of your choice. Anyone who thinks that that's actually what salvation is, is clueless about what the Scriptures are talking about. When man sinned, you see, God had already prepared the salvation of mankind by allowing the Lamb to be slain. The dilemma that was presented, but since God foreknew it, it was not a dilemma to God, but it would be a dilemma to us, was this, you've created man to carry your image and likeness in the earth if Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 can be believed, which is a different message altogether from the typical evangelical gospel which I just talked about, give me your hand, give God your heart, join the church of your choice, turn around and do some good works, get people to come in and wait till you go to heaven when you die. (laughs) No comprehension of a prior intent. Why did God create man in the first place? According to that gospel, God, there is no prior purpose for the creation of man. Man just happened to be created. And since he sinned, God had a, 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 a responsibility or even a desire to just save him. But why didn't God avoid the whole matter by simply not creating him? 
no, no. God planned to save him because the purpose for which he created him was worth the price of saving him. So the gospel is not about going to heaven when you die. Yes, we do go to heaven when we die, but that's neither the beginning nor the conclusion of the gospel. That's a statement of an outcome, but it is neither the principal purpose nor the principal object. So why did God create man? God created man to carry the glory of God, which is to say it is the manner in which the invisible God might demonstrate who He is through a visible agent and that visible agent was created and labeled Son. Adam was the Son of God. Now you've heard me preach this many times. Now, God knew the end from the beginning, so when he, before He created man, He provided for his salvation. Now what I'm driving at here is to show you why there has to be a great tribulation and why we can't escape it. It was designed to produce a result that is absolutely consistent with the original intent. That's what I'm doing. All right? And so those who would sidestep the great tribulation can only focus on going to heaven when you die. And that's the appeal of this rapture nonsense to them. Heaven is the final destination, it's the be all and end all. Well, that's rubbish. You couldn't possibly have a serious knowledge of the scriptures and conclude that. I'm not speaking against going to heaven when you die, but I'm surely speaking against that as the prime intent of God. Among other things, why is He coming back? If going to heaven when you die is the objective, why doesn't He cut off the point at which people are born in the earth and then let people matriculate up through their lifespans to heaven when you die and close the age, close the chapter? How convenient it is that these people no longer preach about the return of the Lord and if they do, it's about how He comes to catch up the last of those on the earth so He can go back to heaven. It, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to actually get my mind around the reasoning behind this gospel. It's just a bunch of hanging threads with, with no tapestry woven as a result. You see, it is the time for the examination of the deeper things of God and unfortunately this level of scrutiny does not allow the trivialized gospel to stand. God knew that man would be lost before He made him, so He planned to save him before He made him. The Lamb was slain from the foundations of the world. Now, why does there have to be a tribulation to bring forth the final remnant? And indeed, why does every believer has to go through trouble in his life? In this world, you will have many trials. Some foolishly say that when, the, when a believer is going through trials, that that's because God is upset at them or because they've done something wrong and they've fallen out of the favor of God. Such nonsense displays a shocking misunderstanding or non-understanding of the value of trials in the life of a believer. So let's, let's get into that. So, Christ coming to save mankind is the promise of God, but how exactly does this salvation work? Let's walk through it step by step and you will see that it's vastly different from the Sunday school gospel that you've been taught and that most preachers still teach. 
The dilemma is this, it's a dilemma for us and for us as we think about it, it's not for God, He planned it, He planned the matter of salvation. So when man sins, he has separated himself from God and he cannot in that condition come back to God. If God simply forgives him or writes his sin off without payment, then God has agreed that that condition of sin doesn't really matter because God overlooks it and simply brings him back. But we know that's not the case because even in the Old Testament there were sacrifices that had to be offered to look to a sacrifice. So God wasn't going to simply bring man back, for in doing so God would compromise His own righteousness and we'd have bigger problems than that. So what does God do? God creates a box, a box, a box known as Christ. It is typified by the Ark of the Covenant who Christ is, is typified by the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. And because Christ as this box is perfectly acceptable to God in as much as He comes as a man, lives a sinless life and offers Himself as a sacrifice before God on behalf of the lost sons of God, on lost mankind, God accepts His sacrifice. Now the box is capable of containing everyone that is added to Christ, every spirit added to Christ is in the box. When God looks at the box, He sees Christ as this compendium of all who have been accepted into Christ and He gives them, attributes to all that's in the box, the same standing as He does to Christ. Now how do you get into the box? That's a key and critical question. First, you have to die. Why why would you have to die? Because this is the principle of adoption. As long as you are identified with Adam and defined by Adam, you have that earthly identity and you're not available to be adopted as a son of God, so you must die. As in Adam, we all die. Because Adam died, it is a given that we too can die and God planned it that way. Now when you're dead, you're nobody's son. No parentage may assert a right over you once you have died. So the end of our lives in an identity associated with Adam is the first requirement of being placed in the box because it strips us of an identity associated with sin. Now when you die, you're powerless, it's the ultimate demonstration of powerlessness. Anyone, they can toss you in the grave and there's nothing you can do to object. When you die then, you no longer have a a power to order your own destiny. You're an, you're, you've come to nothing. The only way for someone to live again after he dies is to be resurrected, to be resurrected. And the only manner in which a person may be resurrected is through a life giving spirit. So the first Adam brought death, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. When you are when you're assembled to Christ, that is an accomplishment 
by the Spirit of God who is a life-giving Spirit who then resurrects you from this condition of death and places you into the body of Christ in the manner in which you were designed to be assembled to Christ. So who God foreknew you to be, that's the part of the body of Christ that you become when by the Spirit of God you are baptized into, that's the fashion of assembling. This is different from the baptism of the Spirit which is for empowerment. The baptism by the Spirit is placement in the body of Christ and the conference of an identity in which God foreknew you or to which God foreknew you. So assembled in that way, you are born again. When you're born again and assembled into Christ, being one operation, you cry out, Father, Father. Now being born again means just that, you're a little, you're a baby, you're a baby. The act of death separates you from the natural and reissues you as an infant in the Spirit, as an infant. So you're placed in the box as an infant, attributed sinlessness, attributed uh, the right to an inheritance and the like, all right? But you must grow up to maturity to carry on what Jesus Himself did while He was here on the earth, which was to put on display the glory of God which is the original intent, all right? So the prophecy concerning Jesus defines this progression. In Isaiah it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And this is the distinction between a newborn who was announced by the angels and the 30 the 30 year old man concerning whom God spoke out of the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son, and would later from the Mount of Transfiguration say, Listen to him. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1 would say, as the book of Hebrews, chapter 1 would say, God used to speak in the times past the fathers by the prophets, but he now speaks to us in Son. But that's not the child who is born, that's the mature son who is given. The child that is born is nepios, that's the Greek term for an infant, for one who comes forth with the potential, the one who has the power to become, a mature son, but the mature son is called huios. He is the one who when you see Him, you see the Father. So the scripture about us being given power to become sons of God doesn't mean we're not born again as sons. When you're born again, the the, the scriptures are very plain. Romans 8 says, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by whom you cry, Father. Now, the process of matriculating from a child who is born, the Nepias, to the son who is given, we us, that process takes you through multiple stages, just like Jesus went through multiple stages. We see him first at the age of uh, uh, the, re- the record of him being born. We see him later being taken to the temple for dedication and we see him meeting with the doctors of the law at the age of 12 and those are three stages. Uh, One would be Napios, the other would be Pideon and the third would be Technon and he disappears from then and we don't see him again until he's Huios the fully mature son, but in between, 
in between, brief sentences summarize 18 years of his life. He learned obedience by the things he suffered, that's tribulation. Tribulation is the indispensable pathway that leads from one stage of sonship to another to another and any time there is a representational son, he has emerged through some form of tribulation. Why? Because it has to do with the disciplining of the soul to return it under the rule of the Spirit, as it was when God made Adam in the garden. So here are the words of Jesus, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. And what shall I say? Save me from this hour? No, to this end I was born. The the spirit, therefore, is willing, but the flesh is weak. Tribulation is what brings the soul back under the rule of the spirit, and the eyes of the soul are closed as the eyes of the spirit are open, and one has a renewed mind. One sees from the heavenly, one sees from the point of view of the eternal. That's how a mature son is. Only in that condition can the son make this statement, if you've seen me, you've seen my father, for the father and I are one. That son says things like, I only do what I see my father doing, because it's the spirit of the man in fellowship with the spirit of God that allows for the transfer of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, power, and the fear of the Lord together with the right to rule, that's what allows for it when the Spirit rules the soul again. So any one in a multitude gathered before the throne of God who would have washed his robes in the blood of the Lamb is one who has gone through the fires of trial. Baptism, water baptism, is described in Romans 6 in the following language. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. It goes on to speak this, for we are buried with Him by baptism into death. So the process by which you you move from being a son of Adam who has died and is available for adoption, that process begins with death. And water baptism is a symbol, it's not death itself obviously, it's a symbol of one being consumed by death. One is not raised because he's raised out of uh, an immersion, you raise him out of immersion because there are laws against homicide. But when you raise him, when he's raised up out of that condition of death by the Spirit of God, when that happens, he is positioned in Christ and is matriculated to that point of maturity that is called adoption. Adoption. That's when he can take up his role of representation. The the Greco-Roman concept of adoption is not that of a little kid in an orphanage that somebody goes and gets and brings home and gives a place and a name and a family history. No, adoption is a very specific thing. Adoption is when you position from among your children the one who is supposed to be your heir. 
Julius Caesar positioned the son of his sister ahead of his own son by Cleopatra as his heir. That son was called Octavian because Julius had the good sense to know that the Roman Empire would not follow uh, a Greek descendant uh, from, from uh, the Ptolemies of Egypt, one of the four generals of Alexander the Great. He knew that that would be a recipe for revolt. So he positioned uh, uh, Octavian, the son of his sister, as his heir. So it's a formal right where God positions you as his heir and he gives you an allotment. The word for inheritance is the word clerou, K-L-E-R-O-O, clerou, and it's where we get the word clergy from. And it really means a lot, like a plot of land, a lot, or the casting of a lot, being selected by nothing more than the goodwill of the Father nothing you've done. So again, you have all this foolish nonsense of clergy and laity. Look, any son of God has been selected by God for an inheritance and he has therefore an allotment. That allotment is the word clergy. Anybody who will tell you that there are only certain ones who are born again who have an allotment and and their allotment allows them to rule over you, they're thieves of your inheritance. Reject utterly the notion that they are clergy and laity because if you concede that point, you've conceded to the theft of your inheritance by, by vagabonds and thieves. So here they are, their robes washed in the blood, standing before the Lamb and they're clothed in white robes. And they worship the Lord, they serve the Lord and worship Him uh, in His temple. Uh, I have one more piece that I want to speak about and that is they serve Him day and night in His temple, in His temple. Uh, that would be the, the, the final piece of this series. You have to go through tribulation. God will protect you through it, but it's through tribulation that you're delivered into the ranks of a mature son. M. Sam Solon will continue. Bye.